just come before God. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being able to preach your word and teach in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, Father, for your love for us. And we ask you, Lord, that not only you would speak to me through these verses, but that you would speak to anyone who hears them. We just ask your blessing on this time now, and we thank you for the fact that you have given us your Holy Spirit to open our eyes and to open our ears and to give us understanding. And we ask you, Lord, to just minister to each one of us right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's just lift our Bibles now. Just say with me now, Father God in heaven, heaven. let your word fill my mind. Let your word be in my heart. And let your word be on my lips. And let your grace show in my life. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. This is a Psalm of David, Psalm 138. And it's all about God's goodness and his faithfulness. And it starts off, I will praise you with my whole heart. So that suggests that we do something uh, with a full commitment, doesn't it? I will praise you with my whole heart. This is not someone who's divided in their, in their thoughts at this time. This is someone who's really worshipping from the heart. They said that David had a heart after God. And nevertheless, he, he still sinned. He still uh, made mistakes. But he had a heart after God. He really wanted to please God. Um, and we have to understand that. We have to understand that we are polarities, that we are living in the flesh, but we also have a... Our soul is unique and it's a spiritual part of us. We are spirit beings, this is who we are. And so this is what determines our physical state. And therefore when we are a bit disconnected from the spiritual, then we, we fall back to the flesh. And there are times when this, the flesh interferes. And there are times when we um, forget in some respects. So. It's important that we try to remember all the time that we need to praise God with the whole heart, not to be half-hearted, not to be someone who is a procrastinator and who really um, is someone who is, is, is neither hot nor cold even, but they're kind of lukewarm. And, and God doesn't want us to be lukewarm. He expects us to be hot. If we're cold, then he can do something about that. And obviously we have to find God. And if we're cold and we know we're cold, well then we look for the fire, we look for God, we look for the heat, we look for that that warms us up and satisfies our soul. But he doesn't want us to be lukewarm. And so this is David saying, I will praise you with my whole heart. Before the gods, what's he talking about? Is this a blasphemy? No, he's saying before the gods with a little g. In other words, all the other gods, all the gods of Cain and all the gods around the other nations worship before these gods I will sing praises to you no matter what happens I will sing praises to you and that's that should be our attitude too that we are in amongst this world we live in this world and and you know we're told that when we're saved we are in the world but not of the world and so we are kind of like in enemy territory here and so there's a sense in which we need to praise God our God, the one true and living God, we need to praise our God in the sight of all these other gods that are counterfeit. And unfortunately there is a, a real move afoot that says we all worship the same God, don't we? And you know, those who want to be um, comforting other people and uh, and trying to be politically correct and trying to let people think that, you know, we're accepting of everything and anybody. Um, this is something where we have to be a bit careful. We do not believe that is, everyone is serving the same God. We do not believe that all these other little gods are actually the living, the one true living God, the God of the Bible. And this is where our faith and our spiritual understanding and our relationship with this living God does tend to say that we are a bit exclusive in what we believe about God. And we make no apology for that. We have to be exclusive because Christ is exclusive. He's not there as the Son of God 
as the only begotten Son of God. He is not there as God incarnate in any of these other mini-gods that are peddling all sorts of things to worship imagination and imaginary gods and bits of wood and stone and even people that are very religious are not serving the same, it's not the same God. It, it just isn't. But of course man wants to be thought of as being good, as being acceptable, as to be pleasing a higher being, but quite often they have got it wrong and they are worshipping in the wrong place. And they don't realise, and some of them are very sincere in their belief that they're worshipping a God. But they don't realise that there's only one true and living God, and that's the God of the Bible. And so, surely we have to stand up and say, well, we accept you, and we love you, because of what God has done in our lives, and because of the grace that God's given us. We love you, even though you may be not understanding. You may be thinking that you're doing the right thing, a bit like a, a drowning man clutching at a straw. You've, you know, men will worship anything rather than nothing. That's a fact. Once we realize that we're at the end of ourselves and we're, the, we're at the end of our resources, like there's no atheist in a, in a foxhole, we will reach out to something and something that we've been shown or taught is what we will reach for. And that's why we must teach our children the truth about God so that when they grow up and they get to that place where they get to the end of themselves and maybe they haven't given their lives to God but there comes a point in their life where they know where to turn. Not to turn to other gods, little g, but to turn to the one true living God. And the Bible reminds us that if if we teach our children the right ways, that in their youth they will return to them. So we have a responsibility as parents. And David here, he's saying, I will sing praises to God. I will praise you with all my, with my whole heart. And so there is a sense in which we have to stand up to be counted when we are believers, true believers in this one true living God, Yahweh, our Father in heaven, our Father Almighty. And he says in verse 2, I will worship toward your holy temple. So he's going to sing praises before these other gods to the one true living God. And unfortunately at that time, <coughs> this was a time when God revealed himself to his people in one place. It was on the mercy seat. It was in the holy of holies. And it would be in the temple. When the temple was built in Jerusalem, that's where he would be. And his Shekinah glory would be there, present with his own chosen people, the Jewish nation. And so every Jewish person believed that God would be in the temple, or that at least was where God would reveal himself, or would come down, and would speak to his people, and would protect his people from there. So Jerusalem, Zion, became a very important place and the temple was incredibly important to Jewish people and just like other people have copied that and have to bow down and pray to certain places in the world we have something that's changed something major changed when Christ was on the cross and he said it's finished and something happened something miraculous happened at that time that the temple curtain of the Holy of Holies was split in two, showing us that this was a new covenant of God's grace, that God would be accept accessible, accessible, <laughs> accessible. God would be accessible to every one of us, not going to a temple or to a church building, but through Jesus Christ. And this was, our, this was our opening where we could come boldly before the throne of God through Jesus Christ. This is why it's exclusive. We don't bow down and point to a place in the world and pray. You can pray as many times as you like. God's not listening. He doesn't hear the prayers of unbelievers. He doesn't believe that they are 
sincere in their heart because they're trying to do it their own way, you see. God has given us the way. God has shown us the way. And Jesus, when he came, he showed us the way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And because of his death on the cross and opening the way for us, he showed us resurrection. He showed us that in the flesh he was killed, he was murdered. And he was in a tomb for three days according to the scriptures and he rose again and he showed us that there's new life in him and only in him no other way and this is where we need to understand we must not get into buildings we must not be thinking about just buildings and yes it's a sacred space yes it's an opportunity to come together as the church the church isn't the building, the church is the people. And as the church, we can come together and create a sacred space, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not against church buildings. I love them. I love stained glass. I was a choir boy when I was 11. You know, I love all that. But I know God isn't found in those buildings. God is found in other ways. God is found through my faith in Jesus Christ. So God is found in my heart because when I come to God in spirit and in truth, when I come to God as a spiritual person, not a religious person that is dependent on things of this world, but as a spiritual person that really has a relationship with the Father through his Son, then I can, I can accept these sacred spaces and, and go, yeah, this is great. And it's excellent to create an atmosphere it's excellent to have banners and little things that help us to feel together in a special way honoring God but the most important thing is whether our heart is in touch with God not whether our out, outside is is kind of superstitious and and in a way kind of relying on all the things around us to make us feel good you can go to any church and if your heart's not right you're not right no matter where you go whatever building you're in you're not going to be right you're not going to be right with God you're not going to feel right in fact some people say they, they get all hot and bothered when they go to a church they, they don't like the religion and the hypocrisy that's around religion but it's because they haven't understood what spirituality is they haven't understood what worshipping God with the whole heart really means, where it comes from, and how we can do it. Because we can only do that through the love of Christ. We can only do it when God shows us himself, when he incarnates in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how we come to God. We don't come through Mary. We don't come through buildings. We don't come through holy water. We come through Christ. This is important to understand. This is really important. And it says here, I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. And so, he's actually saying that the words of God that, that are given through the prophets, they're showing his loving kindness and also his truth. So there's something about, if we want to know the truth, we have to come to the scriptures. We have to look in the Old Testament and see the truth there. That was the Bible that Jesus used. And then as we get the New Testament, we begin to reveal new things as his new covenant of grace comes into being. And we see the apostles and the acts of the apostles and the letters to the churches going through. But it's truth. This is where we find the truth. Verse 3 says, and in the day when I cried out, you answered me. Well, we said that God only answers those prayers of believers, that we're not all children of God, that we've all been created by God, but we're all chosen by God to be children of God, as he chose the Jewish nation, but then he also chose Gentiles to come into his 
family, to become adopted into that holy line, to become adopted into the family of God, to become his body, the church. And so David, because he has a relationship with God, because he has a heart after God, and he's not going after all these other gods, he has trusted God in faith with what God has shown him in his heart. And so it says, in the day when I cried out, you answered me. So there is a sense of boldness. Even in this time, we can say, God heard my prayer because I really truly believe in God and I know that God has redeemed me. I know that I am f forgiven. I know that I have God's grace in my heart for others and I know that I'm right with God. And if I'm right with God, God's going to hear my prayer. It doesn't mean that I'm not, that I'm perfect. It doesn't mean that I have not sinned, it means that I am covered. It means that my heart is right with God and that's what makes the difference. I can go and confess all my sins but if my heart isn't right with God it means nothing. God's not interested. If I'm not accepting God as he's shown me and I've not accepted the prophets and I've not accepted his only son coming to die on our behalf, if I haven't accepted those things he's not interested in my prayers. He's not answering prayers. I might as well be praying to the ceiling. Nothing's going to happen. So I have to come to God in repentance and faith and make God a real priority in my life and to praise Him with my whole heart. And then He sees my heart and He knows how much I want to follow Him regardless of my old nature. And this is what's happening here. He said, You answered me and made me bold with strength in my soul. Well, if you don't have strength in your soul, if your spiritual man is weak and sickly here today, it may be because you're not praising God with your whole heart. Maybe you're double-minded. Maybe you're not really sincere. And maybe you are making promises with your lips that your, ma that your body can't fulfill, you know? And maybe you need to think about what you're doing. Because if you're not able to come boldly before God, knowing that He really knows you, He knows you intimately, He knows every part of you, and He knows your life, and He knows that he's, you know He's called you. You know that you're one of His children. Not just because someone said we're all God's children, because that doesn't work, that's a nonsense. That's not scriptural. You have to understand what God is saying. God, this is the, the book of instructions. It's not about us making our own way and deciding our own thing and then saying, well, that's what, you know, that's what I believe. Even as leaders of the church, this has been propagated through the years, which is wrong. It's absolute wrong to say that we're all God's children. It's a nonsense. How can that possibly be? We have to give God the glory. Verse 4 says, All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, when they hear the words of your mouth. Yes, they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord is on high, yet he regards the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. So we know that Kings and all manner of people have heard the word of the Lord and been saved and bowed the knee and worshipped Jesus. That's amazing. And this is a God who is not, he's not differentiating about you from a worldly perspective. You see, we think of things in worldly perspectives, how much money we've got, where we live, how we live our life in terms of prosperity and success and money. But there is a different kind of prosperity. There's a different kind of way of living that is honouring to God that's not all about worldly mammon. It's not all about money. It's about the heart being praising God with a whole heart and therefore not putting other things in the way. Understanding how God is good and he's given many good things and there's nothing wrong with having good things, but it's our attitude towards it that, that makes the difference. And though the Lord is on high, 
yet he regards the lowly. In other words, he regards people who are poor. Not just poor financially, but poor physically, poor emotionally, poor in spirit, if their heart's right. Because if your heart, if your spirit is right, then you will be able to develop and grow and your spirit can be emboldened and strengthened in your soul. You can be strengthened by God. And all these kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord. It's going to happen. It has happened already and it will continue to happen. But the proud, he says, he knows from afar. We don't have to worry that he that there are people that are arrogant and rude and, and come against anything that we do, uh, thinking that they know better and they, they are right. Because he knows them from afar. He knows before they even move or say anything. He knows. Verse 7, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. This is obviously very comforting to any of us who are going through strife or problems or fears or problems, thoughts and situations that are troubling us, problems, problems for our lives. Because when we're in the midst of those things, we can call on, lo on the Lord, we can call on God. And it says, you will revive me. So there's a, there's a boldness here with David. You will revive. It's not, I uh, hope, please, will you please? Re no, you will revive. I know your heart. I know you, God. I know your ways. And it says, you will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies. So you're going to protect me from the anger of my enemies. And your right hand will save me. There's no ifs and buts about it. Because he was close to God in his heart. Verse 8 says, The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. So he's going to resolve it. He will perfect it. He will bring things about that will resolve my problems things that I worry about, if I let him. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. So I can come to God knowing that he loves me, but I know something else, because the devil has something up his sleeve here, and that is whenever you do something wrong, he's the first one, he's the accuser of the brethren, he's the first one to point the finger at you and say, you're awful, and he uses people to do that as well. But he will try that on every time, and that will make you feel... Mm, well, I did do wrong the other day. Well, I did do something. Well, I didn't say the right thing there. And perhaps I actually had a, a bad thought. Maybe I was... A... But David knew something here. He says, your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. He knew that God was merciful. And what's important is our heart, our spirit towards God. And that's where the mercy comes from. If you're arrogant and proud and rude and think you know it all, and you're not going to bow the knee to God or anybody else. And you're going to do your own thing. You're going to pick, pick and mix religion where you can pick and choose the things you want to follow and leave the things you don't. That's not proper relationship. That's not a res recipro reciprocity. That's not, that's not a reciprocal relationship in the sense that you're doing your own thing and God's shown you how it's supposed to work. He's the creator. He's shown us what we should do. And he says, your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the works of your hands. So he's, he's honest. And he, he's saying, look, I believe that this is who you are. I believe I know your heart. I believe I understand you. And there was a sense in which David also could show us through his actions how merciful he could be. Do not forsake the works of your hands. So he's, he's just calling on God and trusting God and he's saying you know I know I know your heart so please do according to your will for me don't withhold your works in my life I'm trusting in you for everything amen